Welcome to the Aim High Podcast. Do you want to get into real estate but don't know where to start? Today our guest is Jim Lee. Jim is an economist who came to the United States at 11 years old. He started in sales and slowly worked his way into syndication deals by way of being a real estate agent. I promise you by the end of this episode, you'll have a new respect for engineers and how their minds work. Find out all of that and more today where we provide real estate investors with the tools to achieve generational wealth. Welcome to the Aim High Podcast. I'm your host, Bud Evans. Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Aim High Podcast. Today, I am here with Jim Lee. Jim, how are you today? I'm doing well, bud. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure having you. Jim, you and I know each other. We've had a couple of conversations already. Why don't you do me a favor and go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Jim. I got my degree in economics from UCLA in 2010. Started my career as an inside sales representative at LoopNet and CoStar. From there, I became a realtor thinking I can find my own deals and then dabble through the real estate industry. And eventually I started uh, to syndicate real estate and now I've invested over 600 units in the past two years where I've participated in general partner and limited partner. Jim, how exactly did you find yourself in real estate? Like I mentioned earlier, I worked at LoopNet. That, that was my first job out of college. LoopNet is basically, for those that don't know, it's basically Zillow for commercial real estate. As an inside sales rep, my, my role was just to make a lot of phone calls, collect credit cards over the phone. And the clients who I speak to on a day-to-day -day basis, I talk to real estate investors, real estate agents, lenders, property managers, and so forth. So from there, I learned the importance of having multiple stream of income. Yeah, man. And what a great place to do it, right? You're networking with the right people if you're dealing with people who are on CoStar and LoopNet already. I know that you eventually got into syndication, but let's talk about your very first deal. What did that look like? Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> while I was working at LoopNet, I had this agent help me find my very first real estate investment deal, which is a two bedroom, one bathroom condo. It's actually a short sale. And it took me a year to close that building. It was, uh, it was everything I needed to get myself started. I managed this property from A to Z, run the background check on tenants, find tenants, did all the maintenance myself, which I don't recommend just to cut costs. Yeah, that, that was, uh, that was definitely uh, all the experience I needed to pretty much propel me into the, my next real estate journey. Awesome, man. I'm just going to say, man, I know if you're listening on the podcast, you're not going to see it, but Jim's face lit up when I asked him about his first deal. I don't know if you're aware of what just happened, dude, but you just like got real bright. So let's turn the tables and say, what, what was your worst deal? The worst deal I would have to say is my first partnership with other people. We was think we were thinking about running a nursing home. It's called RCFE, Residential Care for Elderly. Mm -hmm. And basically you purchase, there's two components to this type of business. There's the operation, which is managing the elderly, but and then the business part. And then there's the other second component, which is acquiring real estate. And long story short, we bought this property, we converted it into make it fit for the elderly, open up the hallways and just keep all the bathrooms simple with just a rolling shower. And in the end, during lockdown, we decided to close down this business because two, it was two against one, the two, two partners, they didn't want to move forward. And it's the only real estate deal I've lost money in that I can think of. Yeah. So it's, that's just something it's just, you just have to deal with it when there's other partners involved. Yeah. So how did you recover? The, how, the way how it works is that we convert this house. It's a huge five bedroom, four bathroom house. And like I said, we converted it to, to make it fit for the elderly to live. But in the end, we decided to sell the house when we decided not to pursue the business. So we had to sell it to just regular home buyers. 
and we didn't have per, we didn't have a master bathroom per se or a master bedroom and that's that that was a turn off for a lot of homeowners so the house sat on market for quite some time 6 months and we were also on hard money loan during that time so it was just eating our reserves away in the end each partner we end up losing roughly 30,000 from the deal wow and then at what point was it like right after that that you jumped into syndications or was it yeah good good follow up question yes so that was the time where i began to explore different avenue different avenues to make money with real estate cuz because i being a realtor it wasn't a good fit for me so i started to listen to podcasts educate myself about anything I can do with real estate. And I came across real estate syndication and that's how I started. Awesome. And just curious, the differences between an actual partnership versus a syndication deal, like how do you differentiate the two? There isn't. So, <laughs> um, so it was a good learning experience, right? Learn, make sure you vet your partners, make sure you build enough relationship with them to be able to trust how they're going to react in a certain scenario and just speculate. And that's what I've been doing a lot in the real estate syndication industry is that it really does take time to get to know one another and to see each other. And, you know, the most obvious that everybody's going to tell you is track record experience. So that's something that I look really heavy on and and also just talking to mutual friends as well. Find out the past deals that they've done and so forth. So, and that then that's a learning experience from the deal that I failed till now. Great, man. And that's a great point. There really is not that much of a difference between a partnership and a syndication. It's just, it could be depending on the amount, it could be the amount of money that each partner is bringing into the deal. But what are you currently working on? Yeah, so I'm currently working on a syndication deal in Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida. It's a 382-unit apartment building. It's a portfolio of two complex. One is consists of 140 units. The other one's 242 units. It's a classy value add 1970 buildings. Both of them are 1970 in the 1970s. And it's minimum of a hundred thousand invest, seventy five thousand investment, but it's a five year hold, and eight percent pref cash on cash return with two point zero equity multiple. Okay, great numbers. Awesome, man. Just out of curiosity, because I'm about to do a piece on this, but how are you handling bridge loans with the increase, the increased interest rates? Yeah, that's a great question. So two things, make sure you have enough cash reserves, right? So when we raise capital, we make, we always raise a little bit more than what we need for the acquisition, for the closing costs and for the price and so forth. The second thing is, I'm pretty sure you've heard this tossed around in the industry is uh, buy rate caps. So for this deal, our, we have a fixed rate debt at 6.12% for three years. Great. That's a great number, man. Yeah. That's awesome. So obviously I'm going to ask the question. I already pretty much believe that I know the answer, but it, would you say that your transition from the single family and the residential assisted living, now that you're totally into syndications? Yes. So the idea behind getting involved with syndication is I need, I just, any way you look at it, you need to learn how to use OPM, other people's money, right? You need to raise capital to do bigger deals. Because if, if eventually, if you start, let's just say you start like what I did, two bedroom, one bathroom, how many of those do you need to build to be completely financially free or that's going to satisfy your needs, right? It's just a lot easier to go bigger. It's going to make things a lot you're going to be able to progress a lot faster if you get people involved. And so when I, when I thought about that, I was like, I was thinking syndication is definitely something I need to 
take it serious because eventually I do want to go back and pursue RCFE. But right now I don't have the capital. It's, it was, I was buying, I think one of the learning experience I, is that I was, it was, we didn't have enough capital and we can only do one house at a time instead of doing, looking at other options with more capital. And I think that's what kind of killed our deal as well. There's a lot of factors, a lot of variables. Uh, syndication is definitely something that I'm taking more serious and I see myself doing long-term. It's great. Is, is that what's on the horizon or what are you looking for in the future? Yeah. So I want to focus one thing at a time, mastering one thing at a time. Right now, <clears throat> I want to just focus on being really good at raising capital and also focus on one asset class, which is multifamily. And this is the most stable class you can possibly think of, you know, during the subprime mortgage crash, 2008. 4% of single family residents went into foreclosure, only 0.4% of multifamily went into foreclosure. And this is why I decided to choose this asset class so that I can get the investors that believe in me early on board to show them that, hey, this is, we're going to, I'm going to provide you stability and you're going to see this. It's, if you wait long enough, we're playing the soul game, but we'll get wealthy in the long term. That's why I tend to focus on just this right now. And once I get good at it, then I can expand to other asset class and so forth. Yeah, great point. Now, just out of curiosity, because you hear the differing opinions on syndication deals, being a general partner, whether or not you see money now or you see money later, have you, was it easy to start out? Are you cash flowing right off the bat or how did you handle it? Yeah, it's tough. Great question. I'm actually doing full-time syndication now. I gave up being a realtor. And uh, the reason why is because I just want to put 100% of my energy and effort into building this business. And um, to your point, it's hard. It's difficult and it's for, to put myself in this position because I'm not seeing any money coming in at all. And when I raise money, it, it's not. I'm not getting that much money that much income off of that. It's the operator is the one that's making majority of the money in a syndication deal. So <clears throat> for now, all I can do is just constantly put myself out there and live off of the small condo, <laughs> the passive income that I've already built and just try to be very smart about how I spend when it comes to marketing. Cause it, it I'm constantly investing in myself by putting myself out there, going to networking events, building my website and writing eBooks and so, so, stuff like that. So I have to be very smart about that. And for now, the cash flow isn't great from this indication I've done because typically on the first year, we use that cash flow to renovate apartments because our target value see value add apartments. So we don't, we won't see that distribution until year two or year three, once we are able to refinance. Great, man. And thank you for answering that question. I know that clears up a lot of questions that people out there may have about syndicating and gen jumping into that GP position. What is one thing that you've learned as your wealth started to increase? I think it's all about I think the more the hard, the harder I work, the more I, I think about this question that you asked is how much of my time am I trading for money? Essentially, a rich person may derive their income from just one or two streams, right? A wealthy person has multiple streams of income, and that's what we're working so hard is to build wealth to to be financially free. But at what point does do I have to stop and think about, okay, am I just using all my time to trade for money? There's got to be a fine line. You have to learn how to balance that. Yeah, that's a great point. There, there comes a time when you start to realize as you start to increase your wealth that, you know, time is not just money. Time is everything. The term time is money is more about the person who works for an hourly rate and that benefits somebody else, not yourself. Good day, High Flyers. Are you ready to take your real estate investments sky high? Aim High REI is the perfect Facebook community for you. 
Get answers from experienced investors, connect with other motivated individuals, and benefit from valuable resources all in one place. If that sounds like something that interests you, join our amazing network today and we'll help elevate your investing journey beyond what you think is possible. Aim High REI is on Facebook. Just click the link down in the show notes. The best part, it's completely free to join. I help new real estate investors overcome the fear of failure and achieve generational wealth through buying rental properties. Go to BudEvans.com and book a call with me to find out why we guarantee your first rental property. Thanks. Now back to the show. Jim, we're about to go into the four when you're ready. Awesome. Fire it away. Okay, great. So Jim, these are the same four questions that we ask every guest that can help someone who is new to the space achieve new heights. All right, so question number one is what do you use to keep yourself motivated? I would say my why, which is taking care of my family and giving back to the community. I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to move to United States as an immigrant at 11 years old. And now I must take advantage of my time here to work hard and give my parents a better life for the sacrifices they made. That's, that's very strong. Very strong. What is one thing that completely changed your mind? I'm pretty sure you guys have all heard of the Purple Bible, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, yeah. written by Robert Kiyosaki. So he wrote a second book called... I think there's like the four cash flow quadrant. I'm not sure what I forgot. I'm not, I don't remember the title, but that right there pretty much changed my mindset. It's basically what school won't teach you. You have that employee, self-employed, business owner, investor in quadrant, right? Where employees, you, you just have the income, you have a job, you have and self-employed, you have, you own a job, right? But both of the E and S, there's no leverage. Whereas if you go to the business and investor side, and now you get people to work for you, right? You own a system. On the business side, you own a system. People work for you. You have leverage and investor as well. You, may, you make the money work for you. So that's definitely one of the big, biggest mindset shifts for me. Yeah, great book too. And it's not – the knowledge that you just dropped is it's pretty, pretty spectacular. Thanks. What tools do you use to keep yourself on track? Uh, good question. So I, I don't necessarily use any tools, but I use people and not in a bad way. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, basically an, an accountability partner who checks up on me once a month to hold me accountable for the list of things and goals that we have set one month prior to our meeting. Uh, it's been w working really well for me personally because I don't like letting people down. So I would always make sure I complete all the tasks before meeting each month. Awesome, man. All right. And what would you say? Oh, sorry about that. It's, it just keeps flipping out on me. I don't know what's going on here today, but all right. So, it's all right. All right. What would you say you would change if you had to start all over again? Oh, definitely change my attitude about trying new things. I think I uh, used to be, no, I don't think I used to be very close-minded <laughs> and I, and as I go older, I've learned that it's always better to look at other side of the coin, right? There's actually yeah. three sides of the coins, head, tails, and the edge. If you can stay on the edge, you'll be able to learn the most. And by being closed off, you learn the least. Awesome, Jim. I, that's a great analogy. That's fantastic, man. Jim. If somebody wanted to reach out to you, how would they, what would be the best way to do that? You can check out my website, formosainvesting.com. On there, you're able to also download a free ebook. It basically talks about my personal journey as a real estate investor, all the mistakes I've learned and how overcoming these obstacles propelled me to become the syndicator. Um, it's, it's a very short read, only 19 pages long. And then you can also find me on any social media links, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Formosa Investing. Great. And we'll make sure that that's all in the show notes for you. Jim, thank you very much for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Some great knowledge that you just dropped on our audience. So I appreciate your time. Man. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again, bud. All right. It's a pleasure. And for those of you who are listening or watching, until the next time we meet, aim high. Take care.